a common teaching among the forest ajans, that when we meditate we're practicing how to die. The skills you learn in meditation are going to stand you in good stead when life comes to an end and you move on. Now the question is, who are you who is moving on? It's not a question the Buddha addressed. In the same way as, who are you who is meditating? We don't need to ask that question before we meditate. We just sit down and follow the instructions. And you don't have to define yourself as to whether you're an enlightened being trying to remember your enlightenment or an unenlightened being trying to enlighten yourself. Those aren't the issues when you meditate. The Buddha has you focus on what you're doing and the results of what you're doing. In the same way when you approach death, it's, the Buddha doesn't talk about what dies, what gets reborn, or what goes in between. Aside from explaining the process by which it happens, and focusing specifically on what you're doing. Because what happens at death is very much the same as what happens in the process of distraction while you're meditating. You have an intention to stay with the breath. And these other thought worlds pop up. And if you're not careful, you go with them. The popping up of the thought world is like the process of what they call bhava, independent core rising. And then going into the thought world is like birth. So that's what you've got to watch out for. Where do these thought worlds come from? They come from clinging. And clinging comes from craving. In fact, there's one sutta where the Buddha says that craving is the medium from one life to the next, where it's the, the sustenance, the thing that's clung to as you go from one life to the next. In other words, most people at the moment of death place all their hope in their craving. Suddenly find that they can't stay in this body anymore, the whole thing's falling apart. As one meditator once said, it's like a house on fire. And there's no place you can go in the house on fire, you just got to get out. And so this is why many people, when the house is on fire, they jump out the window. Without even thinking about what they're gonna, whether they're going to be landing or not. And the same when most people die. They just jump. Anything that comes along, they jump for it. So what we're learning to do here as we meditate is learning how not to jump. There's another alternative. You don't have to stay in the burning house, but also you don't have to jump. At the very least, if you're not completely awakened, there is one place you can go. You can go to the element of space. One of a John Fuhring's students, an old woman, was sitting and meditating one night in the group meditation at Wadasokara. And this voice came into her ear as she sat down to meditate, tonight you're going to die. So she thought to herself, well, if I'm going to die, I might as well die meditating. And sure enough, she said it was like the elements in the body were falling apart. She was the one who said it was like a house on fire. Earth, water, fire, wind, none of them were any places you could stay. And then she thought of space, suddenly focused on the space element that permeated all this stuff. Space was not on fire. So she hung out in space for a while. And then as her focus shifted back to the elements of the body, she found that the body had gone back to normal. So she hadn't died. That's how she lived to tell the story. But she mentioned her experience to a number of Ajahns. They said, yeah, if you have no other place to go, go to space. It's a good, safe place to hang out. Even though it's still an attachment, it's still a form of clinging. It's a lot better than most of the things that come up. My own experience of almost dying was when I was electrocuted, and a lot of images suddenly came up to the mind. 
while I realized that I couldn't move and I was probably going to die from my own stupidity, from not having checked the electricity. And then all of a sudden I remembered, hey, I've been meditating all this time. I'm going to have to learn how to use my meditation skills. This is what they're for. So whatever the vision that came up regarding the fact that I couldn't say goodbye to my father, my family, regretting the things I hadn't yet accomplished in my life. So you can't go there. So these visions would come and I would just say, nope, nope, and then they would fall away. And then the connection that had me electrocuted was cut, so I didn't die. I'm here telling you the story. But it's interesting watching the mind at that point, because the people who saw me being electrocuted said it happened in the snap of a finger. For me, it felt like several minutes. Your mind spins really fast at that point when you realize that the body can't move, you can't do anything in this body, you're going to have to get out. And it looks for all kinds of alternatives, and these alternatives will pop up. And you need the mindfulness not to go with them. So this is why we practice developing mindfulness, developing alertness. So when distractions come in the course of the meditation, we know enough how not to fall for them. Now, if it so happens you're going to have to be reborn, at least you can choose a good place to go. But it's also good to develop certain skills that don't get you pulled into things that look good but are not going to be good. This is one of the reasons why we practice analyzing the body into its 32 parts. There's one tradition that sometimes you hear in the Buddhist world is that the person who is about to be born sees his or her parents having sex, gets attracted to one or the other, and then zoop, goes down and gets into the womb. It's probably one of the reasons why the idea of your parents having sex grosses you out after for the rest of your life. So this is why we practice analyzing the body into 32 parts, no matter how attractive the body may be. It's good to realize that rebirth in the human realm is not all that happy. No matter how attractive it may look on the surface, you've got to remember there's all sorts of ugly stuff lurking beneath. This is one way you can take apart that image that might appear as you're about to leave the body. It's also good to reflect on karma, that different images may appear, and it's not the fact just because something appears that you've got to go with it. Again, the same lesson you've learned in your meditation. Just because a thought comes into your mind doesn't mean you have to complete the thought or find out where it goes. Just let it go in its vaguely formed condition. The same with these images that are going to pop up at death. You don't have to get in them just because, say, a bad image appears to me. Oh my gosh, all those bad things I did in my life, I really am going to go to hell. Don't fall for that thought, because you've got good karma as well. This is why it's important to remember the principle in karma. We have lots of different karmic potentials. We don't have to go with the bad ones. Try to nourish the good ones. You can do that even at death, if you've had practice as you meditate. So even though the Buddha doesn't answer the question of what dies and what gets reborn, as he often says, this is an inappropriate question. Just as it's inappropriate to ask, well, who's meditating? You've probably heard that old question, well, if there's no self, who's meditating? Remember, the Buddha never said there is no self, never said there was a self. When he points out the drawbacks of different self-theories, he says, you look at this and you just don't see that it's proper to hold any of those self-theories. He doesn't say, you look at this and you conclude that there is no self. Those are two very different conclusions. And it's important that you see the distinction. Instead, he has you focus on what you're doing, the results of what you're doing, particularly the results in terms of the stress or ease the pain or pleasure that comes from what you're doing. The doing is always primary in the Buddhist teachings. You look at the list of dependent core arising, the doing, i.e., sankhara, 
comes comes up first, and the being or bhava comes quite a bit later. Doing is primary, being is secondary. So focus on what you're doing. Learn how to do what you're doing well, because the skills you develop here are the ones you're going to need at the moment of the death. You're not going to need to know the theory of what dies and what gets reborn, but you will know how to. You will have to know how to handle the process skillfully. So that's what we're working on. These skills, staying with the breath, suddenly finding yourself someplace else, but just being able to pull yourself back, and then with time, seeing the process of slipping off and realizing you don't have to go along with it. That's an important insight in the meditation. While you're staying right here, you can actually see a mental current flowing out of the mind. In the past, you've always flowed along with the current. But if you're able to stay still while the current goes, you see the current doesn't go very far if you're not right along with it. Or as a John Munn would say, you're not singing along with it. So it's always a question of what you're doing, not the question of who you are. As that one sutta when the Buddha says, when you really focus on things as they're rising and passing away, you get to the point where the Seeing how things pass away, the notion of their existence doesn't occur to you. As you see them arise, the notion of their non-existence doesn't occur to you. Those concepts he has you put aside. But you hold on to these concepts of realizing that your actions have results, and you can learn how to do the actions skillfully. And the skills you develop here are going to see you through all kinds of difficulties in life, and they're going to see you through death. So focus on mastering them well. So instead of having willy-nilly to place your hope in craving, you can place your hope on the skills that come from being mindful, alert, being knowledgeable, seeing things in terms of the Four Noble Truths. In other words, putting aside the, the ignorance that is so troublemaking that causes all the problems to begin with. As meditators, we may be ignorant of other things, but as long as you're not ignorant of the Four Noble Truths, i.e., as long as you can see your experience in terms of these Four Noble Truths, you know all you need to know. 